University of Falls for Fredericks, who is the Vermont Wood <coughs> Utilization Forester. He's going to give us a background and an overview of Wyndham County and really what the supply is. So turn it over to Paul, and then we'll have some questions and answers for Paul, and then we'll uh, switch over to Adam. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Adam and I talked about how we were going to arrange this, but we failed to let Guy in on the secret. So um, unfortunately, uh, uh, he didn't know what we were planning. So my, my intent, I guess, was to start by, by talking a little bit about the resource, uh, both at a, kind of starting at a state scale, looking at, at kind of a bigger picture view, uh, focusing down a little bit more on Wyndham County, both on the forest resource and, and some of the uh, infrastructure that you already have in place here to utilize some of this wood that's available. And then uh, we did some model runs with uh, a wood supply model that we have to get an idea of what type of volumes we were talking about as far as available and accessible wood here in the county. And, you know, specifically, I, I tried to make sure that I talked about um, not only energy wood, but also about higher grade wood, um, because what we're talking about here is really, as far as available wood, is growth. Um, so it's the wood that's growing on those trees every year is what we kind of look to as being maybe what's sustainable without, without really changing the, the forest base. Um, some of that's growing on saw logs, some of that's growing on, on, uh, on poor quality trees that would be suitable for biomass. And we want to make the distinction between those two things. Um, we certainly don't want to be throwing high value material into the chipper and, uh, and creating energy from it uh, when it's got much, uh, much higher value and, and much more uses. Uh, you know, the forest in the state is a big thing. It's, it's kind of the backdrop for everything we do. We're, we're the fourth most forested state in the nation. We, uh, you know, seven, roughly 75% of the, of the total land area of the state is, is forested. Um, and that, that fluctuates a little bit from year to year uh, based on the, uh, the way the estimates are done. But for the last 15 or 20 years, it's been pretty stable at that level. 98% of our forests are productive and, and available. And, and available is in quotes because uh, the way the Forest Service identifies available, it's, it's basically wood. Um, availability is, is based on the fact that it, it is not um, legislatively uh, removed from harvesting. So, uh, Areas that do not fall into the, the Wilderness Act, for example. So the wilderness is, is uh, removed from harvesting. It's not allowed in those areas. The productivity is really based on, on the ability of those trees to grow uh, a certain amount of wood every year. Um, so the non-productive areas are essentially swampland, uh, high mountain area. Growth exceeds removal. So we're growing more wood than we're losing every year. We're adding to that inventory every year. Uh, you know, removals from the standpoint of the Forest Service include mortality, so the normal death of trees, as well as the harvest. So every year we're adding additional wood. You know, the forest products industry in this state is really a major driver. And a lot of times people don't recognize that fact. It's, uh, it's kind of a, sometimes it seems like, sometimes it seems like it's hidden in the closet. You know, we don't think too much about the, uh, about the forest products industry in, in a lot of cases, but it, it has a significant uh, economic impact. This is, uh, these figures are from a, a, a publication that's actually just been uh, release that's up on the uh, on the Northeast State Foresters website. Um, it'll, it eventually will be on our website. But the uh, you can see from from the numbers here that in direct sales and in direct jobs, we're looking at you know over 6,500 jobs statewide, um, 861 uh, million dollars worth of, of direct sales. If you add on the uh, the multiplier effect, 
which kind of takes into account some of the related industries and, and jobs that are created as a result of, of this activity. It's more like 10,000 jobs and uh, 1 point in $1.4 billion worth of, of economic impact. So it's a, it's a huge, a really huge thing in, in the state. I threw in the forest-based recreation on the bottom kind of as a comparison, um, and we take some of the credit for that as well. Uh, you know, those are, are activities that occur either in the forest or require the forest as a backdrop. So things like um, fall foliage gets thrown into that forest-based recreation because without the, the forest, obviously foliage wouldn't be um, very exciting. So taking a look at some of the, the forest resources and uses in the state, I, I wanted to start by talking about uh, just kind of giving you some definitions before I get too far and too deep into the jargon. And there's a few things we're going to talk about. You know, I'll mention saw logs. Um, you know, a saw log is essentially uh, a log that's going to a sawmill, being produced, you know, being used to manufacture lumber. The lower you get in the stem, the higher the value of those, uh, those logs have, typically, uh, particularly in, in hardwood. Uh, because it's, there's more clear lumber toward, toward the bottom of the tree, um, areas where the, the wood has grown over the old knots. As you get higher in the tree, uh, that's the area kind of in this, this upper section where it says round wood here, um, where you're producing uh, pulp wood and firewood. It's still part of the stem of the tree, but has a lot more defect in it. So it goes for a lower grade product. When we start talking about chips, uh, I'm going to I'm going to refer to bowl chips and poultry chips. Um, bowl chips are essentially produced from the stem of the tree only, and typically it's that upper portion of the tree. the The bowl chip, uh, when you run a when you run the stem of the tree through a chipper, uh, you get a fairly uniform, uh, consistent product. And that's a, a, a chip that's, you know, it's shaped sort of like a matchbook. Um, you know, it's about an inch and a half square and, and a quarter to a half an inch thick. Um, that's the type of fuel that a lot of the institutional size systems, the schools, the colleges, um, those sorts of systems can, can function with. It has to be fairly uniform. When you, when you do whole tree chipping, you include the the uh, tops and limbs. You know, the, the operators in the woods are, are going to remove any saw logs. Um, they may take a few stems, a few sticks of pulp out as well, and then tip, chip the tops. If it's a real low quality stem, the whole tree might end up getting chipped. But the, the main thing with a whole tree chip is it includes this, the branches and twigs. And what happens when you do that, you run it through a chipper, you end up with a lot of uh, oversized material a lot of times. A lot of times those twigs and small branches will go through the chipper without being chipped. They may end up being three feet long. Um, as a result, that isn't a really a very uh, useful fuel in some of these smaller systems, um, like the school systems, for example. Whole tree chips much more commonly will end up at a power plant, some place where they have the ability to remanufacture those chips, to regrind them, and make them more uniform and, and more acceptable to the equipment. So those are the things we'll kind of talk about over the rest of the presentation. Uh -oh. <clears throat> well, I can talk without the microphone, but I'm not sure the microphone can talk without, can work without the batteries. Um, yeah. So if you guys want to put that back together, I'm more than happy to use it. sound it's working um, so I just I just wanted to talk a little bit about the harvest uh, over time what we've seen uh, we've kept records on harvesting in the state since the 40s uh, we actually have a legislative mandate to to collect information on the forest products harvest this this graph is 
all, of, all harvested products combined and uh, converted to cords. So you can see, you know, we hit kind of a low in the 70s, really the, the peak of, of uh, forest products output was at, and harvest was actually in the late 90s, and we've seen it kind of taper off since then. At this point, we've, we've sort of uh, leveled out. And I've got another graph here that just kind of shows it, uh, the, the harvest by product. The, the top line, if you, if, in case you can't read it, is saw logs. The middle line is pulp, and the, and the bottom line is whole tree chips. Um, you know, when, as the economy, in, in this case, I think, you know, overall demand for, for lumber starting to go down. Um, in the last few years, certainly the economy has had a big effect on, on production and, uh, and demand. You can see, you know, both saw logs and, and pulp wood have have kind of leveled out at this point, and, and I think in the next few years, um, we'll probably see that start to climb again. Whole tree chips, as you can see, kind of have increased over the last couple years on the graph, and uh, since most of the whole tree chips are going, in our case, to either Burlington or Rygate to the power plants, um, and that demand has been pretty constant over time. I think what we saw in the last few years was a result of um, some changes in the way the New England Power Pool buys power, and and the way they uh, the, the way they dispatch power plants. That had an effect in in the case of Burlington of allowing them to run much more than they were able to run historically. Um, they were typically running less than 50 percent of the time. That in, percentage has increased, and I think you can probably that probably. Um, relates to some of that increase in the uh, poultry chips. Another trend that we've seen over time is in, in the number of sawmills. Um, in Vermont terms, these are kind of the locations of the, the medium to large sawmills in the state. Um, in most states, you know, where the industry is bigger, these would be tiny little sawmills they wouldn't think too much about. But in our case, uh, back in 1990, we had about 25 sawmills that, that fell into this category. By 2012, we were down about 13 sawmills. Um, you know, we lost quite a number of mills, particularly in the northern part of the state. Not so, so evident in the south, but, uh, but certainly it, it's been across the state we've seen that, the kind of contraction in the industry. On the other hand, we've seen a pretty considerable increase in the number of wood fuel users in, in the state. Uh, we have, uh, you know, for since the early 80s, we've had the Burlington Electric Plant in place, um, Rygate Pump came on after that, but those two utilities produce about 70 megawatts of, of output. Um, we've got about uh, 12 plants now using industrial heat and process steam. When I say process steam, I'm, you know, essentially steam that's doing work. In this case, it's primarily in the wood using industry, and, and those are primarily dry kiln operations, though so some of them are plant heat as well. Uh, Cogeneration systems, you know, we've got a few systems around the state that, that are being used to produce both heat and electricity, usually pretty small scale facilities. Um, the, you can see the white dots there uh, are all institutional cogen. Uh, that's Green Mountain College, Middlebury College, and the North Country Hospital in Newport. Um, we also have a, a small cogen plant at Pesumsic, uh, Pompanusic Mills in Thetford, and uh, uh, BKD, uh, Rattleboro Kiln Dry here in town, also has a, uh, a small cogen unit. <coughs> District energy systems, uh, institutional systems, commercial heat. This is where we've really seen a lot of growth in the last few years. Um, you know, there's everything from the Montpelier office complex, you know, there's 20-some buildings in downtown Montpelier that are all heated on a district energy system. That system's actually being upgraded right now. Um, and, you know, we've got around 43 or 43 
44 or 43 public schools in the state that are, are utilizing wood chips. Um, as well as the number of facilities that are now starting to use pellets. And then the thing that we don't want to leave off the list is, is residential firewood. Um, we don't have really good trend data on firewood consumption. Our last survey was done about five years ago. But at that time, we estimated that 81,000 homes in the state use at least some wood for heating. Um, and at the time we did that survey, I think the pellet use was only like 1.4% of, of homes. So it was a really, a really small percentage um, and before pellets really started to take off. But at your scheme, it's a pretty small percentage. I also wanted to, I wanted to give you a little sense of, of what the wood fuel supply infrastructure looked like in the state. Um, this is information from, from a survey we do of schools um, pretty much every year. We did this, uh, we haven't yet this year. But uh, in, uh, yeah, in 2010-11, we had 14 different chip suppliers supplying the, the school size system. Um, you know, five sawmills, a couple of brokers and trucking companies that, that resell chips. Um, bowl chip producers, and I mentioned bowl chips. These are essentially folks that have poultry chippers. They're taking what amounts to firewood logs, uh, chipping that material, and that becomes uh, fuel in a lot of cases for the school size systems. A couple of, uh, of operations, uh, one in Bristol and one in Topsom, I think, uh, Bruce Linlaw and uh, Jim Labra, that are, have gotten set up state with stationary chippers. You know, they have uh, chippers in place and screens in place so that they're producing a higher quality chip for, for those markets. Um, and then, you know, I also threw in the, the four uh, suppliers of, of bulk pellets. Um, in Clarion, we've got uh, uh, Vermont Wood Pellet, which is the only pellet mill in the state, but uh, uh, Sandry, uh, there's an outfit out of uh, St. Johnsbury and then Energex in Quebec that, are, that also um, supplied schools in that year. So, dig down a little bit into the Wyndham County resources, and, and I want to um, give some credit here to, to uh, Doug Morin, who was a grad student at UVM, and, and did uh, a report on uh, the industry, the forest products industry in Wyndham County, and some of the capacity uh, for the River Ledge Foundation. So I um, shamelessly stole a whole bunch of stuff out of his report. <laughs> so, uh, but it is, it's pretty tough to get data down to a county level um, when you start looking at forest resource information particularly. Uh, the statistics aren't that good. Uh, the Forest Service doesn't really like to report at that level, but uh, it, it'll give you a sense for what, um, what we've got here. So the county is 93% uh, is forested. Average growth rate is roughly 2% a year. That, that's probably the highest in the state. It's a very good growth rate for the forest. We're putting on 2% more wood every year on, on all those trees. Overall, for the entire yes. county, that ends up to be the equivalent of about, two, of about 275,000 forests. Is that net or gross? That, <laughs> um, 86% of the county is, is privately owned. Uh, there's a little bit of Forest Service land. It's municipal property. Uh, it's, this is an interesting statistic. 40% of the land area is in parcels that are 50 acres or less. Uh, on a statewide average, that, that number is more like 25%. So there's a lot more smaller parcels to deal with in, in uh, Wyndham County. And that's important when you start looking at um, how, how people view harvesting. Um, certainly as you have smaller lots and where people are residents on those lots, a lot of times they have a different view of, of uh, 
harvesting forest products than owners of larger acreages um, may. And about 30% of the land in the, in the county is enrolled in the use value appraisal program. So that's land that's, that's being acted on an ongoing basis. Uh, looking at some of the infrastructure, uh, as far as wood using industry and, uh, and wood energy applications, uh, about 15 sawmill, commercial sawmills in the, in the county that um, that we have on our records. Uh, Allard and Sir Sosimo are certainly the, the two biggest, uh, and actually two of the biggest uh, mills in the state, as far as that goes. Uh, and both of those both of those outfits here in, in Braddock. What's the third big outfit? That's, those are actually, we get the wood energy piece. Um, the three wood dot, the three blue dots are actually um, uh, dry kiln operations. So both Sir Sosimo and Allard have dry kilns on, on their own site. Um, Bradboro Kiln Dry is the other one that is the other outfit here right in town that, that has uh, that uses biomass as well. Um, there are so there are three dry kiln operations uh, heated by biomass or, or by wood chips. Um, Four wood chip heated schools, three pellet heated schools, uh, a housing project here in West Brattleboro, and, and an elderly housing project in uh, Townsend as well. So, fair amount of, of infrastructure. Um, we looked at the numbers of students that actually attend wood heated schools, and I think it comes out to about 47% of all the students, the K through 12 students in the county, attend a school that's heated by wood. Um, just looking at some of the harvest numbers, I thought, I thought this would be helpful to kind of frame um, you know, where the county lies. Harvest in 2010, about 23 million board feet from, from this county. And that's about 13% of the total harvest statewide. So that, you know, that's kind of in the, in the ballpark. Um, pulpwood harvest is, is a much lower percentage, only about 6% of the harvest. That's probably related to the distance to markets. Um, you're looking at the nearest pulp mills being in Glens Falls, New York, and Ticonderoga, New York. Um, other than that, you're going to Maine with that, that product. So uh, it's a long ways to go for a low value product, um, relatively. A very small percentage of the whole tree chips produced in the state, only about four tenths of a percent um, are produced in, in Linden County. When you, when you start looking at sawmill, on the other hand, 20% uh, of the statewide total of sawmill residues are produced in Wyndham County. So it, it's kind of an indication of the fact that there's a lot of sawmill capacity uh, in the area. And when you look at uh, overall sawmill demand, 33% of the sawmill demand, of the statewide sawmill demand, is here in this county. And the vast majority of that's going to be at Sir Sosimo and Allard. So the ability to process wood. So getting down to what's available for wood, what's available and accessible. Um, I mentioned that we have this, uh, this modeling tool. This is a, a project that was taken on by the Northeast State Foresters Association. The state foresters from Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York State um, funded this project. And it's, it's basically a, a, a database that, that's pretty user friendly and gives you the ability to, to plug in a number of variables, access uh, forest inventory data from the US Forest Service, and, and make some estimates about um, what, what wood is out there available and accessible? And it, it's really through, the, um, through some of these key assumptions that you're able to do that. So the, the way this model works, and, and you, know, you can go online, this is on the, um, on the Northeast State Foresters website, it's just nefainfo.org. Um, 
and I've got those addresses at the end of the presentation. It gives you the ability to either pick a county or multiple counties that you want to assess, um, or you can use a, a radius method, which is really more uh, a more realistic way of, of assessing uh, wood availability. You know, it's within so many miles of a particular point. So you, you pick your data, your data set, and then there's a number of key assumptions that go in um, related to the amount of low grade wood versus high grade wood, the amount of uh, residuals that you want to remove, so how much of the tops you want to actually take out, and then uh, some of the characteristics around ownership. So what percentage of the private land is in corporate ownerships, farms, other privates, and then split by uh, that kind of that 50 acre uh, threshold. And the reason you do that is that you can then make some assumptions about what, uh, how much of that wood on those different ownerships might be actually available. Um, we know that on smaller ownerships, a lot of times landowners, you know, their big interest is not often managing for timber. A lot of times they're more than happy to do it, but their, their emphasis is really uh, maybe aesthetics, or it may be wildlife, or it may be um, maintaining privacy. So you can adjust these numbers a little to, uh, to give you uh, a more realistic look at what might be accessible. And in the end, once you get out the other end of this um, model, once you plug everything in, is the accessible and available volume. So for this exercise, we wanted to have some idea of how much low grade wood was available. The model also gives you the high value, uh, the amount of high value. And this is all in, in thousands of green tons. Um, if you, you know, convert that uh, 95,000 green tons of, of growth on the low grade wood, amounts to about 38,000 cords a year that would be available. Um, if you look at that high grade number, that's about 51 uh, million board feet of, of wood that would be available. So what we're going to do is kind of take, I'm going to give those numbers to Adam, and, and he's going to talk about some of the opportunities. Uh, I'll put up that, that slide with uh, some of the sources of information, and I guess if there are any questions. Yeah, why don't we take about 10, ten minutes. Okay, about 10 minutes for questions. If folks have questions, otherwise, questions at the end, so yeah. Um, I, I've been looking at this at the material that's available at the Department of Natural Resources uh, relating to the climate change. Mm -hmm. And they have a paper there on, on forests and climate change. And in that paper, they talk about the, the various species of, of trees. Big question. Um, I, I think, yeah, I, I think you know. I think um, I think we, as foresters, we kind of agree that you know we'll, we'll probably see some of those species decline. Other species will will probably come along and and, and take up those um, those same habitats. It, it's not going to be a short term thing, it, as you know, as you mentioned. Um, so, in the, some of those areas that are now growing uh, beech, birch, maple, it may be more of an open mix. Uh, but it's going to take time for those, for those things to happen. And I think it's going to occur uh, over a long period of time, probably. 
Um, certainly, you know, those trees in, from the south, people talk about species migration. Well, trees from the south are not going to pick up and, and walk north. So it's going to take, it, it's going to take some, some time for them to regenerate. I think what you'll see probably is more, um, more of those more southern species, the hickories and the oaks, for example, um, becoming more prominent over time. I obviously I don't have all the answers. We're we're working within the department on on some strategies for adapting to to some of the climate change. One of the one of the things that makes that very difficult is we don't really know what the change is going to be. You know, we know there's going to be a change. It could be wetter. It could be drier. You know, it it's hard to know exactly what that um, what the outcome is going to be. Um, so I guess I don't have a good answer for your question. Sorry. Yes. You put up a piece of information about 1,600 tons of old tree chips being harvested in the county. Uh, that strikes me as uh, almost a non-existent uh, old tree chipping harvest in this county. It's uh, typically on a thinning operation between two and maybe 50 tons per acre. So. Mm -hmm. The 1,600 tons is an 80 acre site. Yeah, it's probably not a. Uh, my question, my question <laughs> is, is the logging capacity is the logging capacity in this county uh, the mechanized logging pole tree chipping operation does it even exist at this point in time? I think. Well, I'll, I'll turn <laughs> that question over to John and Steve in the back. Um, I but I think I operate over in over in uh, Cheshire. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's obviously home free chipping mm -hmm. in the county, and I'm sure it's much more significant than what's happening here. But that number just struck me as being it's it's very low, and it may be it may in, in some cases be an anomaly. You know, some of the folks here in the room could probably um, would probably be a good reality check on that. Um, you know, John Cavey, uh, Steve Hardy, uh, John Adler. You, you know, you guys may know better. What the, what the infrastructure is that exists in the county. My suspicion is there's a fair amount of mechanized harvesting. There may not be much chipping going on. Um, you know, we've, I've been working on a, on a harvesting assessment for the last two years here. Um, down at the end, trying to get the report done. Uh, but I can tell you that, you know, what we, in, we found a number of operations uh, around the state that were mechanized. So they were using mechanized harvesting equipment, but they weren't making, they weren't producing any chips. Um, so there's that that factor too. So as an example, a um, a serious logging contractor, mechanized coal free chipping operation will typically produce seventy five thousand tons a year. Mm -hmm. That's one operation. Yeah. So for sixteen hundred this seems like it's a non existent number. Right. Well, I can I can tell you that you know we rely on on the mills to provide us with that information. It's voluntary information. We may not get all of it, and and you know that's that's part of it. Um, distance to markets is an issue. And, you know, it could be that it's just a little too far to go to Rygate. Yeah, Steve, go ahead. Um, the numbers are very variable. I mean, I had one mechanized crew down in Reedsburg, and they're trucking all the way up to. Mm -hmm. They've already done 33,000 tons mm -hmm. already. I had another night guys who was working in. Um, they have way exceeded that as well. These mechanized crews are coming here, but one of the big problems is, is the low value of the chips and, and, the, and the great distances we have to travel. Yeah. yeah. Those, those figures, I think, are from the 2010. Um, 2010 report, and I'm not sure what the plants were doing in New Hampshire in 2010 either. You know, there's been plants have been up and down, so it, it's hard to, you know, it's hard for me to go back and, and explain that completely. I can say that you know there there is some degree of uncertainty in those numbers. The uh, economic reality that Steve referred to about the distance to the mills, I mean that's held back. Biomass harvesting in Cheshire County in a significant way because uh, it just, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, you can't truck that stuff huge right. distances and, and come out of it. There's too much diesel that has to be applied mm -hmm. into the equation, and that stuff's expensive. Yep, absolutely. That's 
And it's, you know, it is the lowest value product out there. And if, if it wasn't, we wouldn't be burning. You know, the, if, it, if it, at some point, if wood chips get too expensive, then you change to another fuel. And, you know, people sometimes have the feeling that, you know, we put in more biomass plants, we're going to drive up the price of fuel, of wood fuel, to the point where, you know, we're going to be chipping veneer logs. Well, it's not going to happen. It's, the economics are just not there. A lot of people um, don't realize that those wood chips are a highly processed product. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of diesel that goes into uh, yeah. making those chips. Yeah, absolutely. Other other questions? Yes, ma'am. A couple of things. Um, one is, could you speak to the effect on um, this overall wood figures, the possible moving um, new infestations that might be coming in um, over the next couple of years? The one issue that came up um, in the original commission from about a year ago, I think it was either both of them, the um, forester, you know, the state forester gave, gave a report, and he was talking about the issues of changing ownership of those small parcels, which is what you were talking about, and, yep. and, and what, um, what that affects, you know, what, how that could affect the figures. Okay. The, uh, the, um, uh, Speaking to the infestations of, of invasive pests, um, you know, and we've seen that probably most recently in Berkshire County, Massachusetts, in Merrimack County, New Hampshire. Once those, uh, once those insects are detected, uh, quarantines come into play. And so it is possible if, if you end up being uh, in an island where you're surrounded by counties that are infested, um, you may not be able to move wood into an uninfested county. Or it's going to be much more restricted, let's put it that way. Typically what happens is when an insect is found, and emerald ash borer is the one that's most prevalent right now, um, quarantines come into play. Uh, APHIS will quarantine the whole state unless the state quarantines counties. And that's what's happened in New Hampshire and, and Massachusetts. So the state has actually in, in, uh, instituted these quarantines that restrict the movement of ash material out of those infested counties to certain times of the year and under certain conditions. Um, that's not to say that we, we couldn't move material out of the counties. Uh, whole tree chips are, are more of a question mark as to what, how they would be able to move. Um, saw log material, groundwood material, is able to move out of the counties uh, pretty much during the winter, during the non-flight months, as long as it goes to a facility that has a compliance agreement with either the state or the feds. Um, and they have to treat that wood, they have to separate that wood, and they have to treat it in a certain way, um, and process it in a certain way, so that it minimizes any danger from those insects becoming established in, in the new area. The biggest problem we probably have is with firewood. Residential firewood is, is one of the prime movers uh, of these insects. We've shown it time and time again. Um, because it's much harder to regulate uh, somebody cutting a tree in their yard that happens to be dying, um, what happened in the, in the Midwest, um, when they first started getting the, the infestations in Michigan, they found that folks around Detroit, where the infestation started, were cutting down trees, taking the firewood to their camps up in the Upper Peninsula. All of a sudden, we had infestations all over um, Minnesota and, and northern Michigan, Wisconsin. So it's really the firewood that's, that's probably the bigger issue. Um, second part of your question, I've now forgotten. So it was. It's basically the Oh, so the change of ownership. Generation and interests change and not necessarily. Well, certainly as, as those parcels get smaller, we find people kind of get further and further away from the um, uh, from the culture of, of harvesting wood, maybe from, and and certainly where, where you folks are close to larger metropolitan areas, um, you've got four people that are, are looking at their property as kind of their, their Forest preserve. It's sort of their their piece, of, their little piece of heaven. It's a, a place where they can come and relax and be uh, kind of get away from all, protected from things. 
they're not as interested in, in harvesting wood as perhaps some of the you know, native Vermonters who, who have a history of doing that and, and it's, it's part of their heritage to, you know, that harvesting isn't, I guess, isn't, um, isn't foreign to them uh, as it may be to somebody from, from one of the metropolitan areas. So as those parcels turn over and we see um, changes in the demographics of those folks, it, it may become more difficult to, to harvest and, and there may be less available acreage. Um, and that's what I was kind of trying to get at with some of these smaller, less than 50 acre parcels. Those, those tend to be parcels that aren't as prone to being harvested perhaps as, as larger parcels. There's certainly a lot of those that are in the current use program. I think, Bill, you could probably speak to that. There's probably a lot of those less than 50 acre parcels that are in current use and they're, you know, they're committed to management, but um, certainly overall, that, that's going to be an issue.
primarily with uh, bulk pellets, but one of those systems is a wood chip system in Barrie. Uh, we have uh, public buildings and facilities. Uh, the Montpelier project, as Paul mentioned, but we're up to 46 schools here in Vermont, uh, including a couple of schools that are now putting in uh, pellet systems. Um, and then for the, the modern uh, bulk fed pellet uh, boiler systems, we're now at over 120 of those systems installed throughout the state. So th that's great and all, but what does it mean? What's the impact? Um, you know, I think this slide is one of the, the more useful ones. If you look at a snapshot of all of our uh, wood heating uh, fuel use, we're at about 850,000 green tons on an annual basis for the cordwood, the pellet, and the chips, uh, putting everything into a, a green ton equivalent. And what that means is that we're pumping about $43 million back into the state economy just on the, the, the fuel purchase, not including all the you know, the capital investments and equipment and uh, whatnot, just purely in the purchase of that fuel. And then you look at the amount of oil that that's displacing on a BTE basis, it's over 40 million gallons of uh, number two heating oil equivalent of what that volume of wood uh, is conceptually displacing. So that's avoiding a cost of about $150 million in the state economy. That's a per year basis? That's a per year basis, thank you. <coughs> so, you know, real, real economic impact in, in a relatively small state with just something as small of a sliver in the big picture of our, our forest products economy and, you know, high-end, you know, uh, uh, processing of lumber and value-added products, you know, wood, wood heating is just one small sliver of it, but still adding up to, to real impact there. But we're, we're, we're leaders in, in um, in wood energy, but we're also national leaders in our use of number two heating oil. And, and you know, I like to brag about the wood piece. I, I, this, this part I don't like to brag of, uh, about as much. When you look at it on a per capita basis, Vermont is the national leader. We use more number two heating oil than other, any other state in the country. That also, you know, that has to do a little bit of the fact that the Northeast uses um, 86% of the, the nation's consumption of number two heating oil happens in the northeastern region. But also in Vermont, we have uh, Franklin and Chittenden County as being the only two counties that have natural gas you know, pipe uh, access. And, and so that, that's another driving factor for that stat. So when you look at that uh, 186 million gallons of heating oil that we're still burning here in the state, it's, it's the equivalent of uh, three quarters of a billion dollars spent on heating oil, about 80%, you know, 80 to 85% of that value is going out of the state economy. So, so the anecdotal adage on, on uh, you know, heating oil is 80, to 80 cents to 85 cents on every dollar spent is going out of the state and regional economy, whereas when you're buying a wood fuel, 80 to 85 cents on every dollar is recirculating in that local economy. So that's a huge uh, you know, regional economic impact to our state economy. So when you look at the, the, the cost of heating fuels and compare the, the wood fuels against current rates for fossil fuels, you know, fossil fuel, you know, natural gas is in cubic feet or, you know, therms. Um, you got gallons of oil at 139 BTUs per gallon, and a gallon of propane is 92. And you, you've got apples, oranges, bananas, and you try to lump it together, and you get fruit salad. The only way to get apples to apples on an understanding of the comparison, a comparative price uh, or fuel values, is looking at looking at things on a cost per million BTU after combustion. Once you factor the, the energy value per unit that you're measuring moisture contents and boiler efficiencies. And so you can see oil at 350 a gallon is upward to $35 per million BTU, and wood chips and wood pellets are roughly one third or half that cost on a per million BTU a delivered heat basis. Um, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna go into too much of the, the 
savings on the capital costs and whatnot. So I'll skip over that part. So in, in the state of Vermont, if you, if you look at that 186 million gallons of heating oil and, and use that as a, as a clear target, and in the state we have a uh, renewable energy target of by the year 2050, we're supposed to hit 90% of our total energy consumption, our transportation, our heating, and our electricity, 90% uh, renewables by the year 2050. So that oil, you know, there, there's a big uh, a bullseye on that as being one of the, the key targets of what we want to displace with conservation, efficiency, and, and a range of renewables to, to get us there. Um, if you look at the statewide projections of wood resource, uh, going back to some of the work that our organization did with the state of Vermont, more or less there's in the ballpark of about 900,000 green tons of what we can sustain year in, year out, above and beyond what we're currently harvesting of low grade wood. Um, and if you look at that, that volume of, of wood, of additional wood, uh, how far it would go, that has the, the, the energy value to, to offset about 48 million of the 186 million, or roughly 26%. Um, so, so you can put a pretty big ding in that use of heating oil, but it's not going to get us all the way. Can I ask what assumption you make on how that wood is burned? Uh, yeah, it's, it, we're, we're <coughs> looking at um, a combination of chips and pellets and using a certain but, but for a time. So, so we, we were not allocating winners and losers. It was just I understand that, but I'm, I'm thinking in terms of in terms of how the heat is delivered to the building. Is it is it are you thinking of this in terms of having a, a for example a, a wood stove or boiler or something in the building as opposed yeah. to a as opposed to just heating for as opposed to the fuel consumption. For high level conceptual numbers, if you're getting technical, there would be you know, 500 percent line losses in the district heating, but I, we didn't go into that. This is just a big picture of how far the other way. way. So bringing that state level discussion down to, to the county level, um, Wyndham County has a population of about 44,000 uh, people. If you were assuming 2.2, actually that should probably be more like 2.4 people as an average um, uh, population per household, and you assume maybe 60% of the homes were heating with heating oil. Um, and an average home is doing about 750 gallons of heating oil per home. This is not, these are some really crude assumptions, but they're for conversational purposes just to give you a sense of scale and how far, um, how much heating oil is being consumed and then also how far that wood resource could go. You're, you're using about 9.1 million gallons of heating oil just for the residential sector. And that, that, that's the equivalent of about 128,000 green tons annually. So Paul put up a slide saying, what, it was 92, 96,000 yeah. green tons annually. Yeah. So what's that, 85, 86% of it? So you can put a, you could put a very large ding in the amount of heating oil being consumed in this county alone with the resource being grown and then without importing uh, additional wood from out of county. If you look at the avoided cost um, of, uh, of, of, of not having to buy that heating oil, you're looking at about $32 million of avoided cost, and you're pumping back in $12 million back into the local economy just in the purchase of that wood fuel by itself. What's the net BPU if you subtract harvest fuel costs? Uh, yeah, so, so typical harvesting, um, you're getting into energy return on energy uh, investment ratios. Um, typical fossil inputs per ton of, or for 
for our BTU, essentially it's about three to four percent expenditure of fossil fuels in the felling, skidding, processing, chipping, and transport of wood fuels to a, to a facility. So when you look at that and you, um, just on an on a energy, return on energy investment basis, um, doing cordwood is about a 35 to one ratio. Um, getting into chipping is about a 25 to one ratio because there's more fossil fuel inputs, a lot of horsepower in a, in a chipper and diesel consumption. Um, and then for a pellet mill, it's about, if you're, if you're cutting virgin wood, debarking, chipping at the site, and then also drying that material, um, you're at about a 15 to 18 to one uh, energy return on energy investment. To put that into context, doing um, corn ethanol and putting it into a, a car and driving it, it's about a one to one energy return on energy investment. So all of those forms of corn wood chips and pellets look pretty darn good in the greater scheme of things. Cellulosic ethanol, which is four times more you know, efficient than you know, starch or corn-based ethanol, uh, that's about a three or four to one energy return on energy investment. We're pumping billions of dollars into that, and we've got some you know, right off the shelf, ready to go uh, wood heating applications that have <coughs> far better energy returns on energy investment. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, making sure I wasn't too far off. Um, so th there's a wide range of, of wood heating applications. And, and what this, this slide is really trying to do is give you a sense of modern uh, boiler driven heating applications, not getting into the stove market so much. We're looking at core wood at the you know, residential, the you know, farm scale, all the way up to the industrial plant and give you a sense of the uh, technologies, the preferred fuel types, uh, and then a typical range of uh, annual fuel usage, and then also the, uh, the operating efficiencies at the bottom there. Um, really, it's the pellet boiler, the, the district heating sector of the market that our organization really focuses on uh, advancing and uh, growing that sector, high efficiencies, um, and uh, a great opportunity to uh, see more you know, medium to, to large scale facilities as a kind of low hanging fruit of what we can go after and start getting the food. Uh, Adam, what is, what is hog fuel? Yeah, um, it, it's just a, a really low quality um, ground up fuel. Um, it can be like recycled Christmas trees and wooden pallets. It can be pushed up piles of bark and sawdust at a, at a, a sawmill. Or, um, it's, it's just kind of a, a generic Why, why big disparity there in the um, percentage um, on the industrial industrial CHP, 28% to 75? What makes up that difference? Um, so uh, power generation can be done, uh, you can do combined heat and power in two different ways. One is um, you can do electrical lead combined heat and power, or you can do thermal lead uh, combined heat and power. When you do standalone power production of say 20 to 50 megawatts, okay, so in general power. you're at about 20 percent efficiency. Right. Um, if you add heat recovery to one of those plants, you're boosting the overall efficiency to like 35, maybe a max of 40 percent. Mm -hmm. um, that's the electrical lead CHP. If you focus on making uh, heat and delivering heat, and there's a small increment of electricity that you generate, um, that is a much higher, closer to that 70 okay, percent. Yeah, it's a huge range, um, but it's important to know there's thermal lead CHP and there's electrical lead CHP, and there's a very big difference between them. So one of the things that our organization has been doing a lot of work on in the last year or so uh, is cultivating relationships with our counterparts in, in Austria, and in particular the state of Upper Austria. And I've had the, uh, the, uh, the fortune of being able to go over and, and and see what they're up to over there. Um, the state of Upper Austria and the state of Vermont just signed, the two governors signed a, a memorandum of understanding uh, to frame some activities and collaborate 
and share ideas um, and policy uh, um, initiatives between the two states and to advance uh, wood heating and uh, biomass thermal energy in each state. And so a little bit of background about the state of Upper Austria. The state of Upper Austria is this one right here. This is the entire country, but it gives you a sense of um, what they are doing with wood energy. They are absolutely international leaders in this. And the state of Upper Austria has a population of about 1.5 million people. And it's the land area size of about Connecticut. And they have about 45% forested area. And 45% of their uh, thermal heat is from wood energy. They have over 300 uh, wood-fired uh, farmer cooperative-owned district heating systems. And they have over 40,000 uh, pellet and wood chip boilers uh, in all sorts of applications uh, throughout the state. Um, they also have some of the leading um, manufacturers and distributors of uh, modern wood chip and wood pellet systems and uh, really are, are a, um, a leader in district energy. Do you have a question? Yeah, what does a farmer-owned district heating system mean, sir? Is it a group of farmers, or? Well, actually, I've got another slide, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, so, so we, our organization in the state of Vermont has been collaborating with our counterparts in Upper Austria. We're hoping to, um, uh, the, the MOU was just signed back in October, so we're still kind of figuring out the next steps and activities, um, but we're hopeful that we will be doing more exchanges, leading uh, delegations over there, of uh, state officials and uh, legislators uh, to kick the tires on what they've done in an entire state. And oftentimes when we're working to develop a project, uh, bringing a community that's considering putting in a wood heating system or a wood pellet system to go tour and visit another existing system to kick the tires. It's amazing what that will do um, in terms of seeing as believing. Well, when we're talking about the, the entire state of Vermont and how far, how much further we can go with wood uh, heating, kicking the tires uh, and seeing what they have done and not ha having air uh, quality issues, not having you know pillaged their forests, um, they have know, less forest resource, and yet they, they have gone a lot farther further with what they, what they uh, have as for resources. So a couple of quick, quick examples um, of some uh, recent installations here in Vermont. Well, this, is, this one's recent, another one isn't. But this was just installed uh, in Brandon. It's a, uh, about a half million BTU per hour pellet boiler system. They have a 10 ton fabric sack um, there's a small port on the side of the building here where their oil uh, flow tank is. Um, small port for the pellets that are blown in pneumatically into the uh, uh, timber framed fabric sack, a 10 ton fabric sack in the basement of this uh, renovated, newly renovated um, elderly housing and affordable housing uh, complex of about 18,000 square feet. And it's burning about 30 tons per year. Well, they haven't completed the full heating season yet, but uh, a great example of a, of a well fed felt heating system. Um, this is a little bit older installation uh, here in, uh, over in southwestern Vermont at Bennington, Bennington College. They use about 4,000 green tons annually of uh, wood chip fuel, and they're heating about uh, 388,000 square feet of campus space. This is actually a steam distribution system because their campus was already plumbed up for steam distribution. Um, if it were a new campus uh, connection, it would be using a modern hot water uh, distribution from the central plant to all the connected buildings. Um, this, coming back to uh, your question, um, this is a, a town I got to uh, visit in Buchkirchen in Austria uh, two years ago, and they installed there are four farmers, and they all have managed woodlands as part of their farm operations. And they, they operate, uh, they first bought a PTO-driven um, chipper that each of the farmers actually share. Uh, they just didn't, could, couldn't use it enough themselves. They got together, instead of taking their wood chips uh, up the valley a few hundred kilometers to a, a 
particle board plant, um, decided that they would form a cooperative, go to the bank, borrow the money, build their own district heating plant, and they own, operate, and fuel their own district heating plant uh, and sell heat to among the customers, 25 customers in the small you know, mountain valley in, in Gukirchen, Austria. Um, I thought what was really interesting about this model, and I was really surprised at how prevalent the, the farmer co-op model is there. They have 300 in that state alone. Um, is that this, this is kind of a normal thing, and that farmers are the, the equity owners in these district heating plants, and they are the suppliers. And so instead of being controlled on price and, and dictated what they would get paid for their uh, the, 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 their chips that they're pulling off their own managed forest lands, um, they uh, have the value-added processing of taking a low commodity wood chip and delivering a high value you know, BTU uh, as a value-added processing. And, and the bank, bank financing covers the cost of the plant and the uh, infrastructure and the government financing is there? Uh, there is a blanket 30% state subsidy for all district heating plants in Austria. So they finance 70 So here in Vermont, uh, wood manufacturing, uh, Paul mentioned that we have uh, the one pellet mill. Uh, they're, they're actually more like 16,000 uh, tons per year. Um, they are seriously considering building a second mill in Vermont. Um, so there's hopefully some expanded capacity there, but it's also important to remember that there are a number of pellet mills throughout the region, uh, many of whom come into Vermont with their supply. Hampshire, Quebec, uh, and New York. We have uh, three, three pellet mills within striking distance from, from uh, New York. We have two or three in Quebec that are bringing uh, product in regularly, and then one in uh, New Hampshire, and then three in Western Maine. Uh, we also kind of uh, play into the, the supply mix. There's a lot of um, increased investment in specialized bulk delivery of wood products. <coughs> Recently, um, instead of just having 40 pound sacks and taking it and putting it in a stove, uh, central boilers uh, are now being filled with bulk delivery. Uh, instead of using a grain truck that when it offloads into a grain silo, it's an auger based system, and so pellets um, get essentially ground uh, back into sawdust by the time it gets into the hopper. Uh, that's not great for the uh, system performance. Um, so you want to have a nice durable pellet that isn't being uh, mm -hmm. pulverized back into sawdust in the, in the fuel handling and delivery. And so these uh, pneumatic systems will float the pellet off the back of the truck and into a bin, whether it be into a grain bin or into a, into a, uh, a bin in the basement or in the utility room of one of these buildings. You can actually see a fabric, a timber frame uh, fabric sack there. running the motor and blowing those pellets in. Excuse me, yeah. what do you mean by a timber frame fabric? Uh, I'm sorry, there's a timber frame supporting a fabric, a uh, poly woven fabric sack. So, and when you uh, say timbers, it could be two by fours. Uh, Is that six, correct? Six or by not? sixes. Yeah. Six by six. Okay. Uh, I can actually show you a, a photo of one. And then uh, on the to the this, this, this is a, this is what I'm talking about. And then to feed the pellets from there to the burner, then is it still an auger? No, that is an auger. Uh, there are vacuum-based systems, but in the final stage of stokering, it's always an auger. Uh, well, whether it's a short is, distance, they don't. It's a short auger. distance, but yeah, longer distances you don't want to do auger. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, a pellet versus metal, metal wins. Pellet versus air, you know, pellet. Um, you know, really, there's a great opportunity, and wood energy is kind of the, the uh, it touches upon a climate change strategy, renewable energy, sustainable forestry, and rural economic development. So, at the intersection of those uh, four cornerstones, wood energy is a strategy that helps move forward in the right direction on, on all those fronts. Um, so, with that, I'll uh, I'll wrap it up.
I would like to see Do you see any uh, uh, air quality standards on the horizon that might influence the combustion of wood products? Uh, actually, the, the US EPA just passed a, a, a new standard um, significantly raising the bar um, for the residential uh, sector, uh, boilers and stoves and furnaces. Um, there are, um, I don't recall what the actual thresholds are, but it, it was a dramatic uh, change and it is, um, th there are uh, you know, certification and testing requirements necessary to get um, a, a stamp that says you are certified um, when, when you, so, that, so that's kind of on the residential side. Um, there have also been some new standards pushed through the EPA on air quality as it relates to wood combustion. Um, and that segues into the uh, you know, state permitting process for larger systems. We have a permitting process in the state of Vermont for boilers that are over 4.5 million BTU per hour capacity. Um, the good news on that front is that um, over time, actually I think I have a, a slide that shows some graphs of the advancement of the combustion technology itself. Let's see if I can get through. <laughs> Sorry, it's buried here. So, so um, over time, the, the, the state of the technology has increased, and so the overall efficiencies dating back 20 years have increased dramatically. And the, the, the corollary of that is as efficiency increases in your combustion and the, the sophistication of the controlling of the uh, optimal air feeding and uh, time, temperature, and turbulence of routing those combustion gases through your refractory lined uh, combustion chambers before it goes up and out of the stack. The corollary is that you're seeing a reduction in emissions. And so the graph on the right is the carbon monoxide emissions um, as an indicator of other uh, uh, gases that are given off as a byproduct of incomplete combustion. Uh, uh, you talked about combustion. Uh, yeah. What about gasification? And have you seen any, any examples in Austria? Yeah, well, um, you light a match and you have pyrolysis, gasification, and combustion. Um, how do you choose to stage those? So there are a lot of people say, oh, we, we sell a gasifier. Well, uh, if you gasify and then put it into a separate thing and then immediately recombust, that's two-stage combustion. You can do two-stage combustion in one box or two boxes. It's it's combustion. So there there are there's essentially no difference between gasification and combustion when they're immediately phased together. Um, you can have a combustor that has primary, secondary, and tertiary combustion and air feed that is just as efficient, just as clean burning than any quote unquote gasifier. There are many manufacturers who produce gasification systems who only use that label to further distinguish their product from their competitors. But just a follow up on that is, my understanding is that you were talking earlier about combined heat power, right? And yep. Really inefficient, looks it's 25% burning wood to make steam and turn a turbine to make electricity. But in Upper Austria, aren't they also gasifying wood, and then take the gas and run an internal combustion engine as a generator. So that is that. a form of wood, uh, wood gasification where I think the, 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 there is a very clear distinction. So, so that is correct. And so if you take wood, uh, starve it, a, a, a thermal reaction where you're reducing the amount of airflow, you are going to gasify and produce a syngas which will then be cooled and cleaned to a consistent temperature and consistency, and then uh, store that gas and then bring it to an internal combustion engine and actually have a higher efficiency combined heat and power using an internal or ex external combustion engine. So, so that, is, that is true, it is out there. Um, there isn't a whole lot of wood gasification to uh, engine. CHP technology that um, is truly commercialized. There are a number of demonstration projects out there. There are a number of companies who say that they do that. Um, but the operational runtimes of those engines um, are, are 
not, uh, not, not terribly. So that's not happening significantly in Austria? No, they are really focused on the thermal opportunities. And actually where they're doing a lot of uh, innovation in the use of combined heat power for district heating is the use of ORC technology, which is organic Rankine cycle. And so they use a, a thermal oil boiler, so they'll have their main combustion system that will go into rather a hot water or a steam boiler. They'll use a thermal oil that comes to a unit that um, has a working fluid that has a lower vaporization temperature than water does. And so given the input of heat there's less heat required to create a, a, a vapor pressure to spin a turbine, and then they do heat recovery off of that, and that's a you know 85, 75 to 80 percent overall efficiency with a larger electrical efficiency component of the total, um, and also a larger electrical output. Uh, that, that technology. So I think there are many people who are looking to ORC technology to play a, a bigger role in the years ahead in North America. We've only seen a handful of ORC units uh, installed here in the U.S. and there are a number of, uh, I mean there's hundreds of installations throughout Europe. Yeah, Adam, I just wanted to, to note that um, about six years ago we had a number of presentations around Brattleboro um, that, that pretty much Follow the same kind of information that you presented today. Um, so a lot of this was already known then. And there were efforts in five or six towns around Vermont to build uh, biomass CHP3 heating systems. And uh, as far as I know, most of the energy around those uh, efforts has pretty much subsided. And I think two of the takeaways were that uh, there was a lack of development who were willing to, to go in and, and lead the process. And uh, there was also a lack of some sort of state agency or other gatekeeper to facilitate getting access to financing for those types of efforts. I'm just wondering from your vantage point now, um, what do you see in terms of prospects for a new trial, a new, a new wave of efforts? And, uh, do you see some of the, the original barriers uh, disappearing or are they pretty much the same? I think the barriers are still there. I think that the, um, the ownership, who, who owns and kind of takes that leadership um, is one of the biggest challenges. Um, you know, Montpelier project, the city stepped forward and they, they're doing it as a municipal heat utility. Um, I think that that project moved forward because they were fortunate enough to get an $8 million shot in the arm. And you know, that's fantastic and we're hopeful that that project will be a, a shining example and encourage more people to pursue it. Um, I don't think that's a Certainly, certainly not a sustainable model that you know, other folks um, would have to follow. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to do in terms of cultivating this relationship with our counterparts in Upper Austria is look at um, uh, more of the entrepreneur sector who know how to do this and can bring that learning here of how to project manage, uh, keep it lean and tight, to control costs, and also how to convince the financial institutions that while you're selling heat to a couple of really big credit worthy um, institutions where a heat contract is, um, is bankable, um, that you have a lot of the smaller folks that don't have that credit, worthiness, credit worthiness, but that's actually not a bad thing. Having a hundred small customers um, gives you less risk in your if you only have two or three large credit worthy institutions, but the, you know, they go out of business, um, your, your eggs are more in one basket. And so I think that there is a, a learning curve in the entrepreneurial sector in how the projects are developed and, and brought to, to communities, but also I think there's a learning curve in, in working with the financial uh, institutions. And you know, we've done a lot of creative work on financing energy in Vermont pace is one of those. I think that um, where there's a certain amount of financial risk and uncertainty, there may be creative mechanisms to create loan loss reserve funds or you know, loan guarantees to create the financial underpinning um, to take some of the risk out of it to bring it to the, uh, to the, you know, the, the, the typical commercial financial. 
I'm hopeful that we can um, uh, also scale down the scale of some of these projects and do some mini district heating systems. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges with the smaller projects is that there are economies of scale in district heating, and there's also uh, the scale of project in which you can attract a certain type of investor. Um, so if ultimately all the projects have to be bigger ones, I think it'll be a long time before we see more district heating in the state. If we can find models that can scale down to two, three, four million dollar size projects, I think we'll see uh, more successes in the years to come. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, on your Austrian partnership, did anybody crunch the numbers as to, I'm going to call it, BTUs per household in comparison to what they use versus, <coughs> I'm going to say it rather sarcastically, our starter castle size homes that we have in this country <laughs> versus, I mean, I've done a few very short trips to Europe and it just hits you very in face. Most folks live in very small homes in very tight communities. We're the opposite. Yeah, and, and they're really well weatherized, and you know they're not, you know, taking heat right and left. So, so I think that um, yes, I don't have hard numbers, but my anecdotal you know, observations were exactly the same. They're they're using fewer BTUs per square foot or per square meter of, of building space than we are on average. So, I mean, given given that again, it's anecdotal, you know, gut feeling. Doesn't that play into the practicality of apples and oranges, apples to apples versus it may be apples to oranges if you're thinking of you know, trying to promote something like what they're doing? You've got to say, okay, we can do that, but you've got to take your starter castle and have four families in that place instead of one. Well, actually, I mean, in terms of a, a simple payback and in, an investment, I mean, a, a bigger building with more heat demand. If you're cutting your fuel bill, you know, uh, a fuel bill of $10,000 per year cut in half is $5,000, say $5,000 in savings. But if you have a home that has a $5,000 bill and you're cutting it in half, that's only $2,500 worth of you know, savings. So in terms of the payback on the investment for this equipment to get that, you know, uh, fuel bill reduction, oftentimes big, I mean, I'm not advocating bigger, you know, big mansions. Leaking windows. I'm just saying that oftentimes the, the, the better payback in installing this equipment is, are the bigger buildings or the bigger footprint. Um, but I think what's really interesting is that um, how you can um, dovetail conservation and efficiency and weatherization with renewables like biomass and also bring in like solar hot water. One of the things in uh, Austria is that every district heating plant I went to above the, 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 the roofed storage for their wood chip fuel storage were solar hot water panels that came into a buffer tank um, and then the, the, the biomass boilers were charging that buffer tank and then the buffer tank is then sending out the, the hot water from there. So they're mixing <coughs> two sources from the solar panels and off of the boilers into that uh, aggregated uh, thermal storage uh, in the buffer tank. So that happens at the district uh, heating plant scale, but there are also home heating systems, same thing. Solar hot water panel on the roof, buffer tank, and a small pellet boiler, uh, heat, you know, providing both the domestic hot water and space heating at home. Um, I think that one of the things about district heating is that you can go in, hook up to a district heating plant, and with the annual fuel savings of getting off of oil, you can then create uh, pot of money or a fund to further weatherize your house. So all of a sudden, as everyone over time is using fewer BTUs from the district heating plant, now you have idle boiler capacity so you can build an extra line and do a phase two expansion of your boiler plant without ever having to expand the size of your boilers in central plant. So there's, there are ways to kind of dovetail efficiency and switching to, to biomass. They're not necessarily competing interests. Uh, 
there was a group here a couple of years back that did a fairly sophisticated feasibility study on different eating uh, biomass. Some of the members are in this room. <laughs> yes, there are a number of folks here. I was not, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was not part of that study, but I've watched it uh, pretty carefully. And my understanding was that the feasibility study came out and said that at that time, the cost of oil versus the economic benefit of um, doing biomass district heating was basically break even at whatever $2.60 a gallon for heating oil. But my understanding was that that study did not take into account the ancillary economic benefits of um, the broader region. That's true. So would FERC be willing to help us in this area <coughs> do that study to take those factors into account? I think that's good, but ultimately a project will, you know, getting financing is one of the big challenges, and um, you, you got to sell projects based on the, the real, you know, the real tangible economics of it. Um, I think that you, I think it'd be really good to do that work and document those values, um, but, I, but I think ultimately to move a project forward, it's got to be sold on the more conservative financial metrics. Um, yeah. Yes, but if we were to have that other study that is more comprehensive than the economic benefits, we might be able to draw in some of the state and federal funding. To reduce the load for, for the yeah. finance portion. So yes, we, we would be happy to work with you, um, and yes, let's, let's talk further. That's, that's, the, that's the short answer. Would having a state bank of Vermont, like the state bank of North Dakota, help in being able to direct funds to economically viable uh, enterprises such as you're describing? I'm not sure about a state bank, um, but I certainly know that VIDA, um, USDA World Development, um, and uh, you know, there are a number of financial mechanisms, uh, including the Clean Energy Development Fund, that are exploring creating um, uh, loan guarantee pots of money that are held and uh, used to, to uh, provide the, the financial security take some of the risk, or you know, it's the financial backstop to, to the, uh, securing the private sector uh, financing for projects, for real energy projects. So I think that, that um, it doesn't really matter who houses it, as long as it's there and it's uh, available to uh, uh, leverage additional financing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, off of Ralph's question, but uh, to restart, you know, any communities in Vermont who might want to restart a look at the district heating, a couple of your budgets would say, you know, look, sort of think smaller, smaller districts, and also seek uh, entrepreneurial help in the sense that there's not a lot of government mm -hmm. grant money to make it happen. Is that it's, the way to say? Yeah, I think the, the, there's not a whole lot of um, big out there. Um, so if you're looking to get 30, 40% of, and you know, that's your target, um, 30 to 40% on $10 million is a lot smaller or you know, achievable than 30 to 40% on a $25 million. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, one of the big challenges, as I mentioned before, is just the, the, the credit worthiness of the contracts that securing um, when a lot of them are small, uh, small residential and small businesses. There's not a whole lot of the, the balance sheet to, to back it up. So when you act, take all those contracts and bring it to a um, someone who's going to finance a project, uh, that just feels really good. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that uh, looking at ways to find more load and shorter distances of pipe capital cost, reducing the scale of project, and also having a um, larger percentage of your portfolio being in credit worthy you know, institutions or, pu or public entities mm -hmm. um, are, are a number of factors that would help a couple of first projects happen. Mm -hmm. Once those are up and established, then you'll see more time.
tolerance for risk in what a project is. Okay, uh, what I wanted to do um, is, first of all, thanks to